I want to invite you to take a moment and identify your biggest problem today. And if it feels insurmountable, Jesus has good news for you. But that good news is probably not that your problem is going away. It's probably something much deeper and much better. Jesus is particularly close to people that have problems. Now, if you don't have problems, Jesus wants to be close to you too. But in particular, his message is that good news is coming to people that the world thinks are beyond the reach of good news. And we see this when we look at the crowd that he's teaching to on the Sermon on the Mount. You actually have to back up a couple of verses. The Sermon on the Mount, as you may know, begins in chapter 5. But at the end of chapter 4, we're told this about the people that will gather to hear it. And of course, in the uh, New Testament, it was originally written, there were not divisions into chapters and verses. That came many centuries later. So this all flows together. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. You can now live in the presence and power and care of God, healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were rich and successful, people with high status and lucrative jobs and thick hair and thin bodies. And when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up and sat on the mountainside. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And he said, blessed are the educated for they will be employable. Blessed are the beautiful for their lives will be enjoyable. Blessed are the rich for their assets are uncountable. Blessed are the clever for their problems are surmountable. Blessed are you when people shall praise you and be amazed by you and be deeply impressed by you, and speak well of you. Rejoice and be glad, for in the same way they spoke well of the prophets that came before you. Is that what Jesus taught? No. Matthew says, a, a real different group was brought before him. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases. Now you have to picture the people that are in the crowd that Jesus is going to call blessed. Those suffering severe pain. I know what it's like to be with somebody who is in very severe pain, either physically or emotionally, and it is devastating. The demon-possessed. Those having seizures, very interesting. In the Greek language in which this was written, it talks about people literally who are moonstruck. In the ancient world, they often associated uh, the moon with emotional problems. We still talk about uh, lunatics probably at least partially because it's at three o'clock in the morning in the dark in the night when the moon rains, when the demons come and uh, anxiety afflicts us. And I know that very well. My friend Neil Ward wrote a book years ago called Contentment. And he says, one of the signs of authentic person is they sleep well, they sleep deeply. And I am not one of those people. I wish that I was. I'm trying to grow towards it. I think that probably reflects my challenges around just being authentic, but I know what it is to be awake in the hours of the moon. I'm one of these people. The paralyzed. And Jesus healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, these are the people that he sees. He goes up on the mountain, sits down. Why does he go up on the mountain? Well, in the ancient world, mountains were associated with challenges, insurmountable problems. Um... We'll talk about I just don't think I can get over that hill. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Now, those are problems. Where's my help going to come from? But mountains weren't just a picture of problems. They, because they reached up towards the heaven. In the ancient world, commonly, the mountains were thought of as the place where the gods lived. They were places of transcendence. The mountain was where heaven and earth come together. And so we see this throughout Scripture. Mount Zion, where the temple is, is called the mountain of God. Or Elijah on Mount Carmel experiences God in such a deep way. Abraham meets God on Mount Moriah. Especially when Jesus goes up on the mountain to teach. Anybody who was reading Matthew would think about Moses, who goes up on Mount Sinai and meets with God and is told about God making a covenant with his people and then gives a description of what it means to be a good person, the Ten Commandments, and so that would change the world. And now Jesus on the mountain is doing this. Your problems are not the most insurmountable things in the world. And Jesus begins doing this by teaching about who is blessed, and it's not who we think. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, he says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And now I want to tell you a few words from Dallas Willard in his book, of Divine Conspiracy, about the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, he says, serve to clarify Jesus' fundamental message. And this is it. The free availability of God's rule and God's righteousness, God's goodness, to all of humanity, through reliance upon Jesus himself, the person now loose in the world among us. And the Beatitudes do this by simply taking those who, from the human point of view, you know, the people that were just described in Matthew chapter 4, they're the ones Jesus is looking at in the crowd, the fellowship of the withered hand, people like me who can't sleep through the night, maybe people like you whose problems appear to be insurmountable. Those who are regarded as the most helpless, the most beyond all possibility of God's blessing or even interest and exhibiting them as enjoying God's touch and abundant provision from the heavens. This fact of God's care and God's provision proves to all that no human condition excludes blessedness. That God may come to any person with his care and deliverance. God does sometimes help those who cannot or perhaps just do not help themselves. Nancy Aunt Nita one time told me that her favorite verse in the Bible is, God helps those who help themselves. I told her, no, that's not there. We made a big bet on it. She stayed up all night and lost the bet. It's another one of those general prevailing assumptions about who is well off and how we ought to live that turns out to be wrong because God will help anybody who is willing to receive it. Dallas goes on to write about how we need, you need, you need to do this to write Beatitudes in our day. Who are the people that you think are a million miles away from the good life, from becoming good people? And he has a few categories. He says... Uh, there is, first of all, a silly side to this question. If you look at advertising current events, you might think that the most unfortunate people in the world today are the fat, the misshapen, the bald, the ugly, the old, those not relentlessly engaged in romance, sex, fashionably equipped physical activities. And we live in a silly world where we think, no, I'm cut off from the good life. So we must see from our heart, Della says, blessed are the physically repulsive, blessed are those who smell bad, the twisted, the misshapen, deformed, the too big, too little, too loud, the bald, the fat, the old, for they are all riotously celebrated in the party of Jesus. See, it is the love of God and the presence of God that's the good news that comes to us in the midst of mountains that we cannot get over. And then there's the more seriously crushed ones, Dallas writes, the flunkouts and the dropouts and the burnouts, the broken, the broken, the drug heads in the divorce, the HIV positive, herpes ridden, brain damaged, incurably ill, pregnant, the barren, the pregnant too many times or at the wrong time, the overemployed, the underemployed, the unemployed, the unemployable, the swindled, the shoved aside, the parents with children living on the street, children with parents not dying in the rest home, the lonely, the incompetent, the stupid, the emotionally starved or emotionally dead. And on and on and on. Is it true that earth has no sorrow, that heaven cannot heal? It is true. It is true. And that even the moral disasters, they will be received by God as they come to rely on Jesus and count on him, to the worshiper of Satan, to those who rob the aged and weak, to the cheat and the liar and the bloodsucker and the vengeful. Blessed, 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 as they flee into the arms of the kingdom among us. You know, years ago from a trans woman who attended uh, Melo, where I was serving at the time, about 15 years ago now, and she said the first couple times that she came to church, it was just so frightening to her to come into a church that she could barely come and barely hear anything. But then the third time when she came, uh, the sermon that was being preached was precisely on Matthew 5. And what she heard was, Blessed are people like me, for they are riotously celebrated in the kingdom of God. So now, this is the word for you today. Ultimately, it is not your problem that is the most insurmountable force in this world. All through his life, mountains were central to the ministry of Jesus. You might remember it was on a mountain where he experienced this great temptation, and the evil one said, look, I'll show you all the kingdoms of the world. You can be king of the hill. 
Peter Bruegel, a Flemish painter, painted a painting, uh, Children's Games, in about 1560. And there's 80-some games on it. He, he used to paint peasants, the kind of people that Jesus described in the Beatitudes that artists didn't use to paint much because they were thought not to matter much. But to Bruegel, God considered them as important as anybody else and children's games as important as adult activities. And one of the little children's games that he has is the game King of the Hill. They played it way back then. And if you're strong enough, if you're aggressive enough, if you're big enough, you can be king of the hill and you can push everybody down. And that's the way the world thinks we win. But then came the teacher who stood on a mountain one day and proclaimed this good news to you whose problems are insurmountable. Blessed are you because the kingdom will come to you today. Do not give up today. Whatever it is that you are facing, you keep going. Jesus himself displayed this in a way that uh, uh, makes the heart beat faster when we even read it on the Mount of Transfiguration, that the kingdom, the presence of God, that uh, transforming power comes into his life and can come to you and to me and and he faced it again on another mount called the Mount of Olives, but then ultimately where we see it is on Mount Calvary. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame, a love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. And there is where we see the King of the Hill. He is the one who is insurmountable. His wisdom is what is insurmountable. His power is what is insurmountable. His blessing that comes to us is insurmountable, not because it makes our problems go away, not because it will make our circumstances different, but it will make you different in the circumstances that you inhabit. Blessed, blessed, blessed. So be a blessing. Make it a golden rule day. Our God is insurmountable. If you like hearing John talk about the Sermon on the Mount, we've got a whole series on that. So go ahead and subscribe to make sure you don't miss any future episodes in that series. You can also go back and catch up on any episodes that you may have missed. Now, if you're interested in the email or the text alert that goes along with each episode, you can let us know at becomenew.com slash subscribe, and we'll make sure that you get those. If you want to help us spread the word about Become New, the best way to do it is just to watch, like, and comment each video that we put out. So we would love to hear your thoughts. If you wanna chime in in the comments, that would help us and we'd love to engage with you there. Lastly, if you've got a prayer request, there's a group of us who meet each weekday to pray for viewers just like yourself. You can send us your prayer request to the number 855-888-0444 and we would love to pray for you. We'll catch you next time.